My pleasure now is to introduce the chairman of the National Association of Scholars, Herb London. Uh, Herb is currently the head of the London Center for Policy Analysis. He has previously served as head of the Hudson Institute. He is the founder of a college. He is a longtime professor. He is a scholar with more than a dozen books behind his name, a candidate for public office in New York State and in the city of New York, and uh, the best of all possible chairman for the National Association of Scholars. He deeply understands what we're about, and he helps project us into a world where uh, a little organization like ours can have a very large footprint. Um, Herb, please take the podium. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, let me start by saying that I'm a great admirer of George Gilder, and I remember when Wealth and Poverty was written, and it was very obvious to me that he was someone who understood that zero-sum economics did not make any sense. It was a book that was very illuminating to me, and as a consequence, I've read everything that George has ever written, and must say that I've been not only informed, but it's been illuminating. But let me start my formal remarks with a story, a personal story, if you don't mind. It's a story that takes place back in the 1950s. At that point, I was playing basketball at Columbia University. At the end of one game, a young man came up to me, relatively young at the time, and said, what are you studying? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a history major here at Columbia. And he said, a history major. He said, you know, I would like you to join my seminar. I said, join your seminar. What is your seminar? He said, it's a seminar that I give with my colleague, Lionel Trilling. This was Jock Barzin. So I joined the Barzin Trilling Seminar in 1959, and it changed my life. Because what happened in that seminar was not merely the interesting pregnant, pregnant pauses uh, every time that Trilling would light up a cigarette, <laughs> and not only the very elegant French that Barzin would speak, but the exchange of opinion, the extraordinary liberty and freedom that one exercised in that class, the excitement. I used to run to that classroom, fearful that I might miss one minute of what transpired. It was the most exciting moment in my young life. And I said, if I want to be involved in any experience in life, I want to be Jacques Barzin, dress like Jacques Barzin, speak French like Jacques Barzin, <laughs> know as much about Rousseau as Jacques Barzin, and I want to smoke cigarettes in the same elegant manner as Lionel Trilling. <laughs> and, and I did, although the cigarettes almost did me in. But the important point about this was the free exchange of opinion and what I thought was the essence of university life. What a mistake. I got involved in university life at NYU, creating a college, and had the great pleasure of working with my friend Carol Iannone, who was a professor in the college. And we organized the school around the study of great books, not unlike the Columbia CC Hum Humanities program. But what I found over time is that there was an orthodoxy that was emerging in higher education an orthodoxy that had a profound difference with the experience that I had with Trilling and Barzin. I became very alarmed. I spoke to two of my colleagues, Peter Shaw, who at that point was at the State University of New York, and Steve Balsh, who was then a professor at John Jay College. And we organized something called the Coalition of University Professors, a name that was later changed to the National Association of Scholars. Our goal was very simple. What we wanted to do was to create an environment where the free and open exchange of opinion was not merely tolerated, but encouraged. That was what we thought higher education was all about. I read at the time Boston Veblen's rather interesting comment. Same Boston Veblen, by the way, there's a new biography on his life in which he talks about higher education. And in the 50s, he said, one of the great difficulties of higher education is that we are training students in incapacity. Well, we've gone beyond incapacity. We've gone to mow mowing a new understanding of what a university is all about, where in fact what counts is whether you win, whether you can transform the university into a center of left-wing orthodoxy. And you see this with trigger warnings. You see it with microaggressions. You've seen it at Yale. You've seen it at the University of Missouri. We now see it across the higher education landscape. 
For me, this is extraordinary. Where are the oppositional views? I remember when, by dint of my decanal status, I sat in the University Senate, and almost every vote was 77 to 1. I finally said to the president of the university, rather than a voice vote, let's have a roll call vote so I can at least express my displeasure. He agreed to that, but it didn't change the vote. It was still 77 to 1. What you have is academic freedom becoming a kind of antediluvian notion where freedom doesn't exist. It is largely the disposition of a small group on campus, now a very large group on campus, that wants to force you into accepting a certain kind of opinion. The idea that climate change or global warming is a matter that is scientifically closed is absurd. That is the very contradiction of science. Science is open. It's always open to question. How can you have a closed scientific discussion? Is phlogiston to be accepted? I remember when the Club of Rome report came out, and even before that, Paul Ehrlich's population bomb, in which Paul said, well, we're going to be fighting for crumbs in the supermarket in a decade. Oh, really? I think we're suffering from people who are overweight, not people who are fighting for crumbs in the supermarket. And I remember the Club of Rome. We're going to run out of resources. There are going to be so many people on the globe. This is the neo-Malthusian theory. Nonsense. I wrote a number of pieces with my friend Herman Kahn talking about this as globaloney. And it was globaloney. I wrote a book very recently on BDS, on the BDS movement. BDS has nothing to do with boycotts and divestment. It is an attempt to demonize the state of Israel. And when you talk to people about it and then say, let's talk about boycotts and divestment. Let's talk about what divestment really means. You find that they're not really interested in the argument. This is a question of delegitimizing the state of Israel. That's what it's all about. When I was a student, again going back full circle to my student experiences, I earned a few dollars by working as a research assistant to C. Wright Mills. Some of you will remember the power elite and other books that C. Wright Mills wrote. And he was writing a book at the time about Fidel Castro called Listen Yankee. And I was a research assistant on that book. And one of my assignments was to write about the United Fruit Company. And I wrote about the United Fruit Company pointing out it created an extraordinary number of jobs. It was actually a very good company for Latin America and for Cuba. And he looked at all of the research and he said, do me a favor, Herb, take that research, leave my office, and never come back again. <laughs> and none of it was included in the book, I can assure you, because the book was a diatribe supporting the Del Castro. Now, wh where are we at the moment? The National Association of Scholars under Peter's leadership and with the very interesting work that Rachel has produced, has come up with an important, very important document. It's a document that deals with what we are seeing as the politicization of the academy. There are several factors in the academy. One I regard as specialization, which I am very much concerned about, because when you think about what imperils our civilization, it is in part the fact that people do not understand the traditions of Western civilization. When I was a young man, I lived and breathed Rembrandt and Aristotle and the Bible and Sophocles and Shakespeare. That's what I lived and breathed. Today, people can tell you about a period in history from 1842 to 1844. Ask them about Shakespeare. They haven't read Shakespeare. So they don't live in Western civilization. That kind of specialization is a danger to higher education. The second I've already made reference to, and that's politicization. And that is the fact that people want to politicize the academy so that only one point of view is accepted. And we see this across the board in almost every institution of higher learning. I, uh, there are obviously exceptions like Rhodes City College but, by, and King's College. Don't let me forget King's College. But there are, there are of course, this, this generalization I believe holds true. And then there's the third consideration in higher education, and that's what I would call trivialization, where the silliness is encouraged. When Peter did this very, very important work on Bowdoin College, one of the things that was amazing to me is that you can fulfill one of your liberal arts requirements, of course, in the standard science, social science, and, uh, and, and, uh, and humanities categories. You can fulfill one of your humanities requirements by taking a course on homosexual gardening. Now, I don't know what, how homosexuals garden differently from anyone else, but the absurdity of this 
It was a clear demonstration that trivialization is having its effect on higher education. You spend $60,000 a year to send your kid to Bowdoin to study homosexual gardening? Please. And so, gardening. 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 Not bargaining. Not, not bargaining. Bargaining, I might even understand. <laughs> gardening, I don't get. Gardening, you know, planting, putting seeds in the ground. Homosexual gardening. I'm, I'm not exaggerating, Peter. Right? No, the title of the course is Queer Gardening. Oh, I'm sorry. Queer Gardening. It's even better. The last point I would make, I want to come back to what George had made, a point that he made before, and that is the role of technology. Ultimately, technology is going to change all of this. At some point, I don't know when that point will occur, but at some point, parents are not going to spend $60,000 a year for the silliness. And we will find ourselves in a very different position. The average student today leaves the university, he's carrying $36,000 of debt. That's the average. But this is an intolerable position. It's having an effect on social life. People can't start families, can't buy homes, in fact, can't buy cars. And so you're changing the character of America because of this tremendous debt. And for what reason? And so I think Peter Thiel is right. People shouldn't all be attending universities. Many should not. And secondly, there are lots of ways of providing an education without necessarily going to the institutions that are brick and mortar. And so we have to start thinking in technological terms. How do we create the university in cyberspace? How can we can do so in a manner that recaptures the essence and spirit of the American university as I understood it in that seminar with Bison and Trilling. Thank you so much for being attentive.